Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. I'm excited to continue our conversation with David Hawking. He's the author of the Annotated Scriptures. We're going to dive deeper into the book of Jasher, Enoch, Isaiah. And of course, next year we're going to be studying the New Testament. He's got some really interesting things with the Joseph Smith translation in here. And so you definitely won't want to miss this conversation. Check it out. All right, so we've gone through the Book of Mormon. Is there anything else on the Book of Jasher that you wanted to add on that, or have we covered Well, yeah, um, the Book of Jasher has something that's very fascinating to me that I've never had anybody explain to me why we have the Office of Seventy in the priesthood. Why, how did that come about? You don't read it. You read a little passage in the, in the New Testament, and he sent out 70, right. and they came back with a report. And then you, you also the Septuagint, which means seventy. Yeah, you got seventy people that put it together. Yeah. But what is this term seventy? And we have the office of seventy. So I think that the Book of Jasher may have at least a, a, a taste of what perhaps could be the derivation of the office of seventy. And it goes back to Joseph, and it goes back to the Tower of Babel. So in the Book of Jasher, the Tower of Babel, Babel, has. Um, uh, confounding of the language. But Jasher has it as the Lord sends 70 angels to confound their language. So there's going to be the original 70 new languages versus the Adamic lam- language. So now that's an interesting number, 70. The other thing that's interesting about those 70 angels in the book of Enoch, they give you the names of those 70 angels. So that's interesting as well. So 70 is important. So the next thing you read in the book of Jasher, you go through, now you're getting the story of Joseph. Now he's the Hebrew that's been sold as a slave. He's in a prison. And now he's interpreting dreams. The the prisoners love what he's interpreting. Now the Pharaoh wants his dream. But the people say, you can't talk to this Hebrew unless he knows the 70 languages of the kingdom. So symbolically, everything in the scriptures have symbolism to it. So now what is the symbolism? The symbolism is in the nighttime, an angel comes to him and teaches him the 70 languages. The next day, he ascends to the Pharaoh on 70 steps. He talks a language in each step, and he finally gets to where the Pharaoh is. And he now is second in command. So now you have a Hebrew from the house of Israel in a Gentile nation. And what is the purpose? Is to save that nation and the house of Israel. And he is the emollient to that nation. And he is an example to that nation. And what is the office of 70? What are their, what is their calling? Is to take the gospel to the Gentiles. So for me, The Office of Seventy may refer to that story based on the... Now, there's more than 70 languages today, but that's the derivation of it. And I also further project that imagery or that symbolism when Peter says, how many times were we supposed to forgive somebody? Seven times, you know, three times, whatever. He says, you know, so... No, you have to do it seven times 70. So, again, what is the symbolism of that? Is it 490? Is it a number? Or is it a symbol of something? So seven also is seven dispensations until the, you know, until the judgment. And 70 goes back to what I think is the 70 original tongues, meaning metaphorically or symbolically, you have to forgive everybody no matter what, who they are or the language they speak until the judgment day, and it's God that's doing the judgment. You have to forgive everybody. So that's what I think is another cool example of what I find in the book of Jasher. Very cool. And does it have red lettering in there too? Yep. And so- All the format. Once I got the format down and I fine-tuned it like I did, everything transfers, which makes it, again, another cool way of uncovering the layers of what is really good uh, uh, sacred text. Now we call it scripture because it's been canonized. But all of them were sacred texts. 
not all the sacred texts have been canonized. Doesn't mean it's script. It's not scripture. Scripture really, if you want it from a generic point of view, is a sacred text that has truth in it, that has uh, validity, knowing that it has a history that has been validated by other histories. And so I think that these, when when Nephi see other books, he doesn't say other scripture. And when he talks about the book that would come forth from the Gentiles, that's a book. He doesn't say other, a, a scripture will come forth. That's a modern term that we're using about sacred texts. So when I came up with my company called Beacon Light Books, because of my, I'm located on the, uh, in North Carolina where they have seven active lighthouses with a light that goes out and it says, you know, this is where I'm at. You can come, you get safety here. I came up with the term Beacon Light Books, and the subtitle is Illuminating Sacred Texts. Oh, okay. And it's the idea that all of this is sacred, because it's all part of the history of the Hebrews in the House of Israel. And it, and, course, and I'm bringing it forth to light. I'm shining light on it. And I'm then elevating it to the, to the fact that we're finding these little breadcrumbs throughout these texts that support the revelations that Joseph Smith received. Well, cool. So, uh, so Book of Mormon was first, Book of Joshua was second. What was your third book? The Book of Isaiah. Let's talk about that. That one came about because that's a commandment of all of the scriptures, or all the books, if you want to call it, that the Lord said that, he, you know, a commandment I give unto you to search Isaiah diligently. And I had, it pricked me when I read that again. I go, you know, who has really... Avrion Gileadi, he's, he's famous. That's, that's his specialty. He's a Hebrew Jew that is converted, and uh, I honor him. I respect him. I, I feel intimidated by him. I, he is a scholar. I am not a scholar. I'm just Dave Hawking in Raleigh, North Carolina on a computer screen, researching on my own. However, I wanted to do something that was unique. And what I decided to do that would be fresh that no one had ever seen before is to take the differences in the Book of Mormon and highlight them in the King James Version of the Book of Mormon. So what I do here in, the, in the, my annotated edition of Book of Isaiah, unlike Avrion Gileadi that does his own translation of the Hebrew text, I'm taking the King James. But instead of um, just using the whole King James, I put in bold bracket and bold text things that are in the Book of Mormon that are not in the King James Version. And I cross out or strike out words that are in the King James Version that's not in the Book of Mormon. Okay. So what that does, it visually tells you that what does the Book of Mormon contribute to the Book of Isaiah? And it's remarkable what comes out. Mm-hmm. So that's my approach. So I'll just give you an idea what that looks like. Right. So this is the, um, I'll give you an example of, um, you, know, you know, the most famous chapter would be chapter 29. So all of my, cha all of the layout, instead of double columns like I do with this, uh, my other books, here I'm going to have what I call more space. Uh, so I'm not going to do columns, and I have the greater space because there's a, he does everything in couplets. There's a lot of poetry that he does. He's, he's got all of this uh, uh, poetic parallelism is what they refer to. And in the back of my appendix, I give you some ideas of some of the iterations of those poetic pa parallelism. So what I'll do here is I'll have in blue the words of, uh, of, uh, of Isaiah, and then over here the words of the Lord. So in this case here, um, we're going to be into uh, chapter 29. And chapter 29, I'll say, compare 2 Nephi chapter 27. So now as you go through this and you turn the page, you're going to see bold text and it's in brackets. And you can see quite a few of those have been changed. So that's a way for you to see, well, what did the Book of Mormon say about these things? And what, how, how do the word changes? What, does it change the meaning? Does it change the uh, context of what's being said? 
I'll let the reader read for themselves. But doing that it is another visual for you to say that definitely Joseph Smith was just not copying from the King James Version. And then if I go further in here, this is another example of what I do. So this is uh, Isaiah chapter 29, verses 3 and 4. It's all in red because it's now the Lord speaking. But now I'm going to show you what Nephi does in 2 Nephi chapter 26, verses 15 through 16, where he's going to comment on this passage of Isaiah. And when he makes these comments, he's taking from these verses, he's introducing them into his commentary. And then he'll keep on going on, then he'll bring these things into his commentary. And then he'll keep on talking, and then he brings these things to it. So this is another way of visually showing you how Nephi is utilizing Isaiah in a way that he can then tell you what's happening and how to understand those passages based on his setting mm -hmm. and why he's quoting it. Now, why that's important is because it solidifies what I call this. This is Dave Hudd Hawking talking, not... Uh, any general authority, any BYU professor is probably going to be contrary to what they think um, is just my opinion and, it, and take it for a grain of salt. But one of the, there's two times that we hear the phrase for a wise purpose. The first one is when Nephi is commanded to make a set, second set of plates uh, after 40 years after leaving Jerusalem. So he, he's an older man. And he is uh, in the land of promise somewhere. And uh, he's being commanded to make a separate set of plates. Also, we hear the same phrase when we get into the Mormon. You know, Mormon's the editor. We get it in the words of Mormon. And he's saying, you know, I've completed the, you know, the, the abridgment. I'm going to give it to my son Moroni. But before I gave it to him, I went and searched the other records. And I found this other small set of plates that have these prophecies. And I'm going to give it to my son for a wise purpose. So now you've got two, two people saying a wise purpose. So, so the standard response you're going to get in gospel doctrine and your manuals and your, all your institutes and so forth and from the general authorities, which is it's the perfect ex uh, statement, is to replace the 116 pages that, was, that were lost. And I'm sure that is a wise purpose. But my take on that is more uh, spiritual than just a mechanical replacement. I believe that the wise purpose is Isaiah. And I say that because it occupies those small plates, a large portion of those records of that small plate, with a lot of commentary on Isaiah. That's why when we get to 3rd Nephi, when the Lord also is quoting Isaiah, then makes this statement, a commandment I give unto you to search Isaiah. So then I would then postulate that this, the abridgment that is being made by Mormon in the book of Lehi may not have had Isaiah in it. And so for the wise purpose, I want you to make another set of plates and I want you to have not only your kind of retrospective history and who you are and why you're here, but give the spiritual background based on the prophecies that the uh, Isaiah had made to let you to let the audience and the reader know that it's all part of the you're being you're fulfilling these prophecies that Isaiah made. Hmm. That's my perspective. All right. So, anything else about Isaiah that you want to add there? I, don't, I, I, I have to tell you, when I get to Isaiah, my eyes gloss over, and I'm yep. like, I don't know what they're talking about. So, I think th so far the feedback I've been uh, getting from those who have got it have said, and it's true in the sense that not one any one book is going to give you the answer. Right. But they said your book has given me a lot more answers than I had thought. <laughs> Even though I'm not a scholar, you right. know, I'm not, I haven't had any peer-reviewed articles, and I'm not in that little circle of people that, you know, academic circle. But my intent, again, is to research uh, in a way that's unique. And so without a computer and a software package and the Internet and the ability to search for things, I would be dead in the water. I'd be like back to the days of Hugh Nibley, going to the library and taking three by five cards 
and then assembling them in such a way in your handwriting and giving it to the secretary, you type it out. <laughs> <laughs> but I can do it all in my home now. So, right. so therefore, what I do is I will go through and I do my thing by organizing the format, and I do my format, and then as I read it, I get inspiration, if you want to call it that, or, or uh, um, what does this mean, or gosh, what is that referring to, or I need to know more of that. So I go to different websites and different places where they have Bible scholars, you know, Bible Hub and um, uh, Bible Study Light, and there's many different sources, and I, and I peruse them all. And when you go to these places, they have Bible commentators. So you've got Protestant ones, you get Catholic ones, you get Hebrew scholars, you get Bible dictionaries, you've got uh, Smith's, you know, concordance, you've got Cambridge Bibles, you've got all of these different sources I look for. And I scour them, and then I find something that is of interest to me, that feels like, well, oh, I think that'll be a good thing to add. Right. And so I add that, and I add that, and I add that, and I get you know, our scholars, and I get our prophets. And we, so I have a plethora of these different mixtures of different points of view. So therefore, it's not my own point of view or my way of doing it. It's I'm letting them speak so that you can get an understanding of what they think. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a refreshing. It's not coming from one point of view. I'm, I'm, and it's not an LDS only point of view. It's a point of view over a course of many generations by different people from different backgrounds. And I have the gift to put it and assemble it in a way that you can read what I found interesting to make hopefully interesting to you. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good skill to have. Yeah. And it means I've spent a lot of time doing it. Have you run it by Abraham Gil Giliati? Yeah, I've got his. And uh, I reached out to him to say, you know, I'd like to have you contribute. And he says, no, thank you. For good reason. I, I respect him. Like I say, I think that's the proper thing to do. He stands alone as a premier, premier scholar in the world of Isaiah. Um, you've got um, Rhonda Pickering. She is a scholar as well. She's in the in the camp of of a uh, Avrian Giliati. Um, so she is remarkable. Uh, he is remarkable. They would be the ones that I would say you defer to them because they know more. They know tons more than I do. However, what I've done is unique. They haven't done what I've done. Mm -hmm. So I think the two or the three or so whatever. they haven't commented on yours at all. Uh, yeah, I would say that Rhonda is the one that reached out and she says, I like what you've done. I like the way you formatted it. I like what you've done with the Book of Mormon inserts and so forth and bringing. But again, uh, my perspective is different than theirs. Right. Yeah. So anyways, every and then in the back of my, I always have appendix and the appendix are always filled with extra stuff. So my extra stuff is who are these um, kings? in these different areas of, of Jerusalem, of Judah, and, and the northern kingdom, and who are the surrounding nations, and what's their background. So I bring that information, and I have maps in there, and then I have, you know, here are the different forms of parallelism, poetic parallelisms. And then I also have a section in, uh, uh, in the, uh, what I call the uh, Oliver Cowdery letters, in letter four, where he talks about how Moroni says that the prophecy must be fulfilled before uh, that is written in the book of Isaiah that the the book that is sealed must be uh, brought to the one that is learned. And so that's an interesting thing that's in that letter four is that Joseph Smith, before he even started translating the Book of Mormon, he was told that it must be fulfilled in the book of Isaiah. Mm -hmm. So I bring all that stuff in the back so that it puts in perspective uh, why we have Isaiah. From the very beginning, it's part of the fulfillment of the book of Isaiah. Right. So let's talk about your fourth book. That's the book of Enoch, right? Yeah, now Enoch is the one that's the most controversial, if you want to call it, because if you just look at Enoch at face value, it's woo, it gets out there. Because there's different iterations. Like I say, you get Ethiopic, you get Church Slavonic, you get your Hebrew with the Sefer Hekelach, and then you've got your, you know, in the book of Jasher, you get chapter 3 and 4. And then I also include another thing called the Legends of the Jews by Louis Ginsberg. He was a German Jew uh, during the before World War One. What he did is he took all of the literature that was available at that time, the Hebrew uh, corpus of material, 
And he came up with a narrative. You know, here's the story. It's like a Josephus type of thing, a historian. So it's not chapter and verse. It's just a, it's like reading history. So in the back of the book, I have his uh, volume three, section one, uh, sec, uh, volume one, section three. And what that does is it, it's part of the uh, uh, Enoch story. And again, I, uh, it's called The Legends of the Jews uh, by Lewis Ginsburg. And so when you get in here, it's just, you know, it's his um, writings about Enoch based on all the literature. And look how many pages have to do with Enoch. I mean, there's a lot. So there's a lot of history about the Hebrews that knew and taught about Enoch that we don't get in our Old Testament. So I, try, so I assembled every one of those um, issues that were found at different times and translated into English. And what that does, it, it helps one to see that Enoch was a major figure. And for some reason, and I don't know all the reasons, there was a decision made that this stuff is just a bunch of made up stuff and therefore we're not gonna include it in any of our material. However, the Russians, they highly regard Enoch as being a, an important book in their corpus of material. The Russian Orthodox Church? Yes, they do. Ethiopic group down there, they regard him. So here's what I do to, to begin with. So what I end up doing with Enoch is I have my introductory material, but then I have this chart. And so this chart is just a timeline that goes into, in Genesis, we know that Enoch was not, he walked with God. Then you get to the New Testament. You get St. Jude says, you know, here's, he's going to come with his 10,000 saints and judge the ungodly. We also have a section in, in Paul where he talks about Paul was translated, uh, that Enoch was translated. Subsequently, I found a lot of other passages in the New Testament. <laughs> we'll get to that. But anyways, all of a sudden now in this year, 1773, uh, J uh, James Bruce, who is a Scottish explorer, uh, wants to find the source of the Nile River. So he goes down to Abyssinia. And he's also one who likes to go to and find antiquities. And he goes to the museums and somebody tells him that, you know, here, you'd be interested in this. This is the uh, Book of Enoch. I'll take it back with me. They gave him three copies. He kept one to himself. He sent one to the Bodleian Library in Cambridge, England, and he sent another one to the library in Paris. And it was there for a long period of time until 1921, Richard Lawrence, who could understand and read Giez, which is a Southern Semitic language, he, was tra he translated it. And it was in a manuscript form in the library, sat there until 1838 when it got uh, put in a book form. So then it goes from there, and then you've got the timeline that Joseph Smith receives his revelation and then these other books come about. So I put it in this chronology telling you the main events. So it sets the stage so that when you get into your first chapters, you're going to be reading what were the Ethiopic. So when you start from the beginning, you're going to see my highlighting like I did with the Book of Mormon and all my other books. Anything of interest to me, you'll see extra material down here. And then same th it'll go on and on and on. You'll see all of the comments, and there's multiple comments I'm making because I'm finding, I'm finding connections left and right. I mean, now they're everywhere. So at the very end of the book, I then compile all of that into, gra into charts. And so for 16 pages, I take a look at every one of these issues the first Enoch, which is the Ethiopic, the second Enoch, which is the Church Slavonic, the third Enoch, which is the Hebrew, and I compare passages from the Book of Mo uh, Moses that Joseph Smith received as a pure revelation, and I compare specific passages with passages that come from these various editions. And I have page after page after page after page of these comparisons. Oh, wow. So what that does, again, is that these are the breadcrumbs that all end up being a slices of bread that end up being a loaf, <laughs> indicating that uh, what Joseph Smith received as a uh, pure revelation 
is indeed something that has been supported by these other uh, documents. So again, all of these uh, fragments that Joseph Smith received are now being validated physically by these additions. And so there's no possible explanation that Joseph Smith could have plagiarized anything. So now the next question. If we so could, you're saying the Book of Enoch in the Book of Mormon as well? Yes. And so when you get into the Book of Mormon, for example, there's a phrase that um, Samuel the Lamanite talks about, your riches are slippery, and with you know because they're slippery, you you're not going to be able to hold on to them and so forth. That's coming from the Book of Enoch. Hmm. You're not going to find that. Legend? You're not going to find it in the book in the Old Testament. It's in the Book of Enoch. Hmm. Also in the Book of Enoch is the Book of Abraham, or the Book of Abraham comes from the Book of Enoch, and the reason why is because we get the names of these angels in the Book of Enoch. As I told you, there's 70 angels here, and, there, and the, each angel has a, has a role to do in the planetary scheme of things. So what, what, does we, what do we get for weird, weird names in the book of Abraham? One of the f weirdest names we have is Kolob. Right. And then we have Kokobim. So K-O-K, -K, K O B. The book of Enoch, we've got Kokbiel, who is angel over the constellations. What is Kolob? It's one of the constellations, a big planet. So I bring all of that out. And so these weird words that, you know, Joseph Smith made up these words. No, they have historical precedent in the Book of Enoch. Very good. Related to planetary uh, celestial events. Hmm. We also have in the Book of Enoch, the Enoch calendar. Now, John Pratt, that you... Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned he that. He mentions, and he does a lot of work on the Enoch calendar. I reached out to him. It's so unfortunate that he passed away, because two days after he passed away, that book of Enoch that you saw was delivered to him, because I, he, he gave me permission to use his material in the right. appendix. Right. And, uh, and I honor him by doing that, because he said the Enoch calendar testifies of Christ. That was one of his main themes. And as one who researched ancient calendars, he was amazed that the ancient calendar of Enoch provided a lot of explanations of what we read in the scriptures. Right. The way he told me about that calendar, it sounded really cool. I'd rather have a, every day starts on January 1st. It's always a Sunday. Yeah. And, you know, every, I think each month has 28 days, right? Yeah. It's all based on the fact that you have the equinoxes that, you know, that do its thing. Now, here's another example of something that's interesting. I have the, the different, um, what I call the Enix, uh, is shown the ten heavens. So he's going to, you know, go up into the different uh, portions. You know, we have our three kingdoms, but then there's three kingdoms above that, and there's another kingdom. So, in other words, this is another story that's validating what Joseph Smith received as a revelation, because Enoch is experiencing these different levels, if you want to call it. But here's what's cool. I'll read this to you. And the Lord said to Michael, now here's what's interesting. What do we know about Michael from Joseph Smith's revelation? Who is Michael? He's Adam. So now here's, think about this. And the Lord said to Michael, who is really Adam, according to Joseph Smith, go and take Enoch from out of his earthly garments and anoint him with my sweet anointment and put, into the gar put him into the garments of my glory. Now I let us stand at that. What is that somewhat, sounds somewhat familiar to you? So this is in the book of Enoch. There's a temple experience that you're going to find in the book of Enoch that relates to what we get in our temples. Very cool. So that's why I say this is such an interesting book. And the fact that they all came after the Lord said in 1835, these things were written in the book of Enoch and are to be testified of in due time. So for me, the perfect control is... Enoch. Joseph Smith's credentials is Enoch. It's not the Book of Mormon. Enoch is the credentials. Because he 
didn't have any manuscripts. He didn't have a parchment. He didn't have metal plates. He didn't have anything. He was just a pure revelation. Sidney Sidney Rignan was just writing what he was wording out, out of his mouth. And there's Sydney, no not Sidney. Sidney wasn't a scribe. Are you talking about yeah. something else? Sidney Rignan was a scribe for the Book of Enoch that time frame. Oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so what's what's remarkable, Jared Halverson, who worked on the um, in the Religious Science uh, Religious Study Center, he was the one that got to see the original manuscript that the Community of Christ had. So there's this synergistic thing, you know, they have these ancient documents that are kind of decaying and BYU's got these, you know, high-end cameras they can digitize. And so if you give us uh, access to it, we'll digitize it. We'll give you the copy that did it. But it gives us access to the original. That way we can look at transcription to see how, you know, not translation, but, you know, what's going on with the lettering and the handwriting. He says, when you get to uh, chapters 6, 7, and 8, the Book of Enoch, it's like it's coming fast. He refers to it like a Mozart masterpiece, meaning Mozart wrote his synthesis once. That was it. He didn't go back and edit it. He didn't go back and change anything. I already know it's in my head. I'm going to go record it, and that's it. It's done. He says, do you do that in your college papers? You know, you do it once, done. No, you go back and you crack, and you do this, and you change, you do this and that. He goes, this is what the Book of Enoch is. It's just pure. It comes as fast as you can. Start writing, and there's no revision. So that's the control I'm talking about. You know, as a scientist, when I worked in research, you always had to have standards and you had to have controls. So now what is the control for the book of, for Joseph Smith? It's actually the book of Enoch. Hmm. Because there is nothing that he has in front of him. He's not plagiarizing anything. He can, he's not copying anything. It's just words out of his mouth being recorded. So let's take a look at those words that's recorded and the provenance of that is solid as, as a rock. And let's compare it to these fragments of other things that purport to be Enoch over many years in different languages and different cultures. And how does it stack up? It's clean, it's precise, it's clear cut, it's rock solid. He is a revealer of ancient texts. Hmm. Very good. All right, well, did we save the best for last with the New Testament? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so this is my, uh, let's say, uh, what I consider my cum culmination of all what I've learned and how I format, how I uh, create um, what I call the visual way of learning, um, the elements that I've done throughout and also my uh, uh, learning curve with the software and what I can do with it and what I, uh, how it uh, enhances my work. So again, as I said before, without a software package, without an internet, without me, with the, my ability to learn that software, I'm self-taught in everything I've done. I've never had a program, I've never been to a school for any of this stuff. I'm, Truly self-taught. I believe I feel I might have had this in the pre-mortal life, or who knows what's happened, but I just know how to do it. But this is the culmination of it. And I chose as a cover an equivalent cover to the Book of Mormon. So we know that when I came up with this cover, mm -hmm. we made the decision that we'd have a picture of the Savior on it, and it because it's another testament of Christ. Mm -hmm. And usually when you have the New Testament, it's just as the New Testament, but I wanted to make it look like the Book of Mormon cover that we chose. So now it's the, the New Testament of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And so by doing that, I've, I've separated it as a unique uh, way of saying that this is a special volume. And then I say, you know, it's the Joseph Smith translation, the 1867 uh, first edition. So in this case here, what I do is I take the actual text that's online and you can download it. It's 1867, it's in the public domain. You can look it up on Wiki and you'll say it says it's in the public domain. And so I, um, I introduce every, uh, so when you get into the Gospel of uh, Mark, there'll be a page that says, okay, now we're gonna, we've got a new Gospel coming up. And then there'll be a little blurb. Again, you'll see my references where I got it from that tells you that this is a little bit of a synopsis of who Mark was, and then you're gonna get into now the, uh, the actual text. 
and they have the same elements. You'll have the blue when um, it's quoting scripture. In this case, it's being quoting from Isaiah. You'll see the same gold uh, uh, shadowing that tells you some information at the bottom. But everything that is from the Joseph Smith translation will be bracketed uh, text that's been italicized. So as you read and you continue to read, you're, re you're reading it fluidly. You're not being disjointed. Every version that I've read or seen is that they'll have either this is the original and this is what the Joseph see. You're always going back and forth. Or there'll be a footnote, this is from the Joseph Smith. And so it's, it's, it, it's cumbersome. Right. So I've made it so it's smooth. And it's the entire, it's not pieces, it's not fragments, it's not something that we've been, uh, our church is, or when I say our church, the uh, Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints in uh, Salt Lake City, they have uh, got an agreement with the Community of Christ Church that they have access to portions of the Joseph Smith translation, not the whole part. Right. And so because they have copyrighted, like our church has got for their own protection, uh, things that is of value to them that they're going to want legal protection to, just like our church would do the same. However, once it's out of the public domain, no, you can do anything. The book, uh, the Bible is out of the public domain. Uh, the Doctrine and Covenants is out of the, doc, uh, out of the public domain, unless a new revelation comes and so forth. So what I end up doing is do that. Now, the other thing that makes it very interesting how I approach this, I'll give you an example with uh, the Beatitudes. So the Beatitudes is Matthew 5. So when you read the Beatitudes, you're going to read uh, it just like you would normally read the Beatitudes. It's going to be in red lettering. That's the Lord speaking. But now I'm going to do, you're going to turn a page, and there's going to be two insight pages. So now I'm going to compare the normal King James Version Beatitude, blessed are they, blessed are they. But right next to it, I'm going to give you the Joseph Smith translation of the Beatitudes. And look at the white space here. Mm -hmm. Look at what's being added. Now all of that is bracketed because that's coming from the new translation. Not, not a phrase or two. It's not uh, John, uh, Adam Clark that's making this. This is Joseph Smith. Well, you know, I don't want to get into the controversy. Oh, I do. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, it's, there's a lot of new stuff. Yeah, there's a few things in there that might be, yeah. but you can't say that's from Adam Clark. It's brand new material. Okay, yeah. but, so now I have this comparison side by side. So now I'm going to take the same thing here, which is the Joseph Smith um, Beatitudes. And now I'm going to compare it to the Book of Mormon Beatitudes. Now that's interesting, isn't because it? Because there are differences, right? Exactly. So instead of having to go back and forth, back and forth, and compare, compare, I'm doing it side by side. Okay. Okay? And then I do, I do that throughout this, because as you go through the entire new translation of the New Testament, there are many revelations during that process. So he starts the new translation in June of 1830, which starts with the book of Genesis, which is the book of Moses, which it becomes part of the book of Genesis. Then it goes into a revelation he receives that we get in our Doctrine and Covenant says, okay, I want you to stop and I want you to now do the New Testament. So he's going to be working on the New Testament. Now, as he's working on the New Testament, He's receiving many revelations. He's got a brand new church, you know, to get the, it was organized April 6, 1830. Now he's got conferences he's going to, he's got priesthood, and blah, blah, blah. And now he's going to be working on the New Testament, as well as getting revelations. So now he's continuing. And now, so as he goes through the New Testament, he gets another revelation. Or let's say section 76, he's into a point where you know, you get the resurrection. So he's making a question. Well, if he's got a resurrection, there's got to be more than one place that people go to. Then he gets the revelatory experience. So all of those I introduce, those revelations throughout the text. So you see what's happening as he's going through and how revelations that we have in our doctor relate to his process. So I'm doing that, which is kind of, kind of neat because you're seeing it real time. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing I do that's unique that no one's done Again, from a, uh, from a perspective of uh, making this a unique volume, by itself, if all I did was that alone, I think it would be worth the effort to get it. 
I have the red lettering, I have that. But I do everything in, um, as letters when you get to the epistles. So now we're finally, we're finished with the double columns. We're finished with all my foot uh, insights on the foot, uh, on the bottoms and the artwork and so forth. Now we're going to get to the epistles. So the minute you get to the epistles, the first one will be wrong. So now we're going to give you a little bit of history of how he and where he is and what he's doing. I have artwork. All this is from Wiki Commons or from some f public domain source. And I give all the references where I got it. And now we're going to have no double columns. Right. They're going to be like letters. And all of my commentary is going to be off to the side. Now that opens up more space for me to do things because there's going to be a lot of quoted scripture. Yeah, I'm glad you're doing this because I thought that was really cool. So now when you get into the open scripture, look at this. Now this is something that no one's done. And now it's done. I did it. So what does this say? What does it say is that he'll say, as is written. Now in blue, it'll be from Psalms. Now who, so right from the beginning, who is Paul? He is, he was a Pharisee. And what is a Pharisee? It's a person that really understood the scriptures. So he was called by God to be the apostle. So why? Here's some of the reasons why. He can take, are the Jews any superior to the, you know, uh, to the Gentiles? So no, no, not one. So he'll take from Psalms 14, verses 1 through 3, these are the couplets he's going to be using. Then he's going to start with body parts. He's going to have uh, mouth and, and tongues, and he's going to have lips and so forth. And he's going to pull from many portions of the scriptures all over the place. Mm -hmm. So he's going to go Psalms 5, then he's going to go Psalms 140, then Psalms 10. Then he'll pick up Isaiah with the feet, and then he's going to go all the way back to Psalms 36 with an eye. Yeah, that's really cool. So now having it done this way and having it in blue and then highlighting where he's getting it from, that's the worth the price of admission. Right, right. <laughs> because you can see it. You and it's a visual. It. And, you know, it's in it's, a poet, it's poetic and everything. And you can, yeah, you can and I have it. so much in there. It makes so much more sense. I think it's really cool. So to me, this, you know, my audience, you're listening to me, I'm, I'm going to be a salesman here. I think this is essential for next year's Come Follow Me. It's on, a, on the news. This is the first time we as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints have the privilege, uh, the honor of actually seeing what was commanded of Joseph Smith to do as part of a branch of his calling is to do this. Mm -hmm. Now we have it in our hands. Now, yes, it's not coming from the corporation of the first presidency or the legal department, and they haven't gone through it. It's in the public domain. Mm -hmm. And no one's going to beat you up saying you've got a copy of it. You can sit there with pride and say, I finally can read what Joseph Smith did as part of his calling. And I am so grateful that I have it in my hands. And not only that, but I have such a unique way of learning it and understanding it that it is something that should be in every LDS home. And I'm not doing this for my own glory or gain. It's because it's essential you have this in your home because this is part of his calling. And we need to honor Joseph Smith. This is the prophet of the dispensation of the fullness of time. We have it in our hands now. Yeah, that's awesome. So a couple things come to mind. All right, so since you mentioned Adam Clark, uh, let's go there. Um, one of the things that Thomas Wayment, uh, professor at BYU, said was a lot of the little one word, one or two word changes yeah. come from Adam Clark, not the revelatory sections like you mentioned, right? but a lot of the little one, one or two word. And he also said that if we updated the English into modern English instead of King James English, we wouldn't even need a lot of those. Yeah. Uh, ignoring the, the revelatory passages, which yeah. you mentioned. What are your thoughts on that? I would say that that's probably 99.99% true in the sense that there are many, many places where as you read what I've done, where it's one or two words. Instead of which, it would be who. It's more proper. Mm -hmm. You know, God which, God who. So 
did Joseph Smith go to those uh, commentaries by Adam Clark? Mm, there's a good possibility he did. Do we have a record? Is there any provenance that we can point to that would say we definitively know that he had access to those commentaries and he tediously went through that? I would argue the following. Without, his schol without Weymouth's scholarship and his other, which I respect highly, in fact, he is superior in every way to who I am as a human being. My background is in science. His background is that. He's done more work and more research in what he knows than I'll ever know about what I've done. Having said that, I would say the following. When I look at the calendar, and I look at 1830, 1831, 1832, and 1833, and I go from June of 1830 to July 2nd of 1833, that's within about a three-year period of time. By the time he finishes up, he's only 28 years of age. And during that time, he's receiving roughly 57, 58% of all of the revelations that we have in the Doctrine and Covenants. Think of that. What an output during that time. And it's during that time he's going to conferences, he's having meetings, he's traveling, he's got a family, receiving revelations, where does he have time to sit in the library and go through and research this stuff? That's my he question. He did that between 1820 and 1830. <laughs> well, 18, 1830 to 1833. You're looking at a three-year period of time where oh. he's... So what I'm getting at is that where is the time for him to take and do research like Weymouth has? Raymouth can do the research. I respect that. I mean, I, there has no doubt. But there's so many passages that do not come from Clark. Is Clark being inspired? I would say yes. Did Joseph Smith get inspired? Obviously he did because there's things that, that Clark never had. So therefore, I would say it's a combination. It's a combination of Joseph Smith authentically based on what I just showed you about the Book of Enoch, that he was a revealer of ancient texts. He had a gift that's unexplainable. We have to have faith. Without faith, we can't go and move forward. It is the essential of our gospel. If we reduce everything to physical evidence, we will never get there. And those who want always to look for the physical and ignore the faith, they're missing something. And so I want to just say that I have the faith, knowing what I know, looking at the calendar, looking at time, and what humans can do within that time, within the environment of that day and age, and what's available to them in that day and age, and looking at the output of what happened during that time frame, and looking at what's come forth that is coming after his life on the earth, I would say unequivocally, I have the physical proof that he was a revealer of something that is unexplainable. And therefore, I have the faith and the testimony that Joseph Smith is indeed a prophet, seer, and revelator. Well, cool. Um, the, the other thought that I had was, are you familiar with Denver Snuffer's version of the New Testament? Or of the Bible, actually? I don't have his, but I am familiar with the, a Denver Snuffer. And uh, other than the fact that you know he was excommunicated, he had he was very prominent in the church in the sense they had good callings and leadership and so forth, and that he had issues with the you know the doctrines and so forth. But I haven't explored his teachings or his book. I do I know that I, there is something online. I've looked at it casually just to see it, uh, similar to what John Pratt talks about with the thing down in Brazil. I casually look at that, yeah. but most of the is casual only in the sense that I'm interested in it. I like to explore it, but my time has been consumed because of these projects. Well, I can see why, and you can see why. Yeah, the 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 reason I bring it up. One of the things that Denver did, which I thought was pretty unique, um, was not only did he use the Joseph Smith translation in much the same way you did, but 
a lot of times Joseph would say in a speech, well, I'm going to refer to this scripture, and I could render a more trainer translation, which might be this. Yeah. And so it wasn't official Joseph Smith translation. Correct. But Denver has included those yeah, see, in his Bible as well. Yeah, and I think that there's some merit to that, because that does give you a, the mind of Joseph and how he thinks. That's a good thing. To, it, there should be no fear for that. Well, is that something that you think would be interesting to add into yours? I mean, you know, I could say if, if Joseph Smith said the following, I, that could be one of my side comments. Yeah. You know, this is what you see here, but then later on he said the following. Right. You know, if I had access to that material, that would be something that I would add. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. If it's coming, it's similar to what Joseph Smith said, I'm picking up a bone of a Nephite. That's something he said. I want to include that because that's from him. So, yeah, I would be no problem with that. And, um, and uh, overall, anything that would enhance the role of Joseph is important. Now, having said that, one of, the, one of the things that I learned in this process as I assembled all of the commentators, so in the back of the, uh, my appendix, I have a listing of all the people who have contributed to my side notes in the, in, in, you know, the in, insight pages. And it includes Baptists and, and Lutherans and Catholics and you know all the different. You know, Even Adam Clark. I, I have Adam in Clark in there. I've got. <laughs> I liked uh, Charles uh, Ellicott. I've got McLaren in there. I love McLaren. He's the Baptist preacher up in uh, in Scotland. I love what he says. So I include all this stuff in there because I I like it and it says a lot of things that we learn and we know about what in, in our doctrine. So I include it for that reason. And uh, having said that. What I learned in that process, and I didn't have enough time or space to do it, uh, but it, it's something that I've internalized and I can speak in a, let's say in this setting or in a fireside setting, is that what I learned in this process is that the translations that we have from the King James to the American Standard or the new versions of this, or if you look at, so if you go to Bible Hub, just give you an example. You go to BibleHub.com. Bible what.com? Bible Hub. Hub. Okay. H-U-B. And you go there, and that's just one of many I go to, but you go there, you can choose the translation you want, which version. Mm -hmm. And then you can choose which commentary you want. And what I find fascinating, a lot of them will say, well, this wasn't rendered correctly. It should say thus. It's amazing how many do that. It's amazing to me when I went through that exercise that Joseph was doing what others were doing in his day. Others were doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. It should not be read this way or rendered this way. It's more accurately if you do it this way. So he's not out of the mainstream. But because he's controversial, he's out of the mainstream. <laughs> But they're not controversial, but they did the same thing. So I, I could have put that in the book as well, but I didn't want to clutter it that way. But it's, it, I wanted only to, them to have another witness to what Joseph Smith had in his version. So an example of that would be, you know, Joseph Smith is always referring to the, the two roles you know, it's not my will, Christ saying, it's only, I only do that which is I do to my Father. You know, I only, you know, forgive them, Father, for they know not. So it's always, you read the scriptures and there's two people. There's Christ and there's his Father. and He's subordinate to his Father. He's not superior. He's not equal to. He is subordinate to his. I only do what my Father tells me to do. I get direction from him. So that's what, you, that's what comes forth in the scriptures, you read it. Now, you go to the Baptists today, you go to the Catholics, no, they're equal. They're not. He's subordinate to his father. And you see the commentary, and I put it into the thing. They recognize he's subordinate to his father. Like, can you have, give me an example on that? Yeah. Um, gosh, I have to go up through the pages. I've got so many pages in my mind. I'll have to get back to you on that one. One of the things that I loved about my Thomas Wayman interview yeah. was where he, in his version of the New Testament, he talks about where they added the Trinity into um, the Bible, the yeah. book of John, I believe it was, and uh, 
that it wasn't it was like a 15th century forgery and I was like what <laughs> so here's an example I have a, a insight page that says I seek not mine own will but the will of the father who hath sent me so instead of which who has sent me it's who has sent me that's the bracket so that's in John 5:30 so now who I commentary from I've got Charles John Ellicott I've got Matthew Henry uh, so those are two that I just chose. I could have chose more, and then I got James Talmadge to add our voice to it, or when I say that the, you know our church, our church's voice. Right. But I'll give you some from Matthew Henry. He'll say, "Our Lord returns His declaration of the entire agreement between the Father and the Son, and declared Himself the Son of God. He had higher testimony than of John. His works bore witness to all He had said, but the divine Word had no binding pl- abiding place in their hearts." And as they refused to believe in him, whom the Father had sent, according to his ancient promises, the voice of God, accompanied by the power of the Holy Ghost, thus made an effectual to the conversion of the sinners, still proclaims that this is the beloved Son in whom the Father is well pleased. See, so I mean, that's a pretty strong declaration from a Protestant. Hmm. And Ellicott does the same thing. The verse is the expression once again, but now with special reference to judgment of the thought with which the discourse opened and which runs as a current throughout the whole. As in all his works, so is in the greater works of life-giving and judgment, the Son cannot act apart from the Father. The judgment must be just because it is not one of an isolated will but one in accord with the eternal will of God the Father. He seeth the Father's works, and in like manner doeth them. He heareth the Father's will, and that alone he seeketh. Hmm. What page is that on? That's on page 130. Oh, 163. 163. So, I mean, mean, those are strong emphasis from theologians that are Protestants. Right. Very interesting. That's good research on my part, <laughs> finding this stuff and putting it in the palatable short statements along with the picture. <laughs> so it becomes <laughs> visual that adds emphasis to a little phrase. So you get this little phrase, one verse, but now I'm going to expand that with these other points of view. And they're not only our point of view, and that collectively are other witnesses to what we learn. Very cool, very cool. Yeah. Well, what are you working on next? Well, the the next logical series would be, of course, um, after the Book of Mormon, you've got the, I think it's the Doctrine and Covenants. Oh, really? Not not the not the Old Testament. I was. We do the Old Testament now. I know. When I'm looking at the "Come Follow Me" classes. Oh, okay. Yeah. When I look at Are that. Are you going to create a Doctrine and Covenants like this? I pretty much have done a lot of it, but what's unique about what I'm doing again is that it's not going to be called the Doctrine and Covenants. Okay, that's a kind of a. It's kind of a, a sad that we call it the Doctrine and Covenants because originally it was the Book of Commandments, and then there's the lectures on faith. Uh-huh. But the lectures never get codified as canonized material. So I thought they were canonized and then they took them out. They never got canonized. That's why they took them out. And so what happened is the, the doctrine really was the articles of faith, or, or the lectures on faith. And the covenants became the revelations or the, you know, the, that. So, but anyways, what I have in mind, what I've started to do is... As I show you that I'm going to introduce Matthew. I'm going to introduce Luke with a separate. Here's, now there's a division. Here's a page. Now we're getting into Luke and we're going to go into John. Now we're into the Acts of the Apostles. So what I've got is sections based on the chronology of his revelation. So I'm going to be calling it the Revelations of Joseph Smith in chronological order. Oh, I love that. So what happens is their story is unfolding. You actually get a story with it. Yeah. You don't, it's not jumping around. I've always wondered why we jump around so much because I would love, that's always been one of my things. I want to read it in chronological order. And I'm working on it. That's cool. So the first section that you're going to get in my section is the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. All of the revelations that are early on have to do with that. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah. So you see it now 
progressive. You see it as it's coming and coming and finally they get the book and so forth. Now the book is published. Now a new section comes in. The Church of Christ, eight, April 6, 1830. Uh, That's on a Tuesday, by the way. It's not a Sunday. Right. It's on a Tuesday. Now the revelation has to do with church government, priesthood, duties and responsibilities. It's beautifully laid out. And you see it just keep on going. So that's 1830. All of a sudden there's going to be another break, another heading, another break. 1834. They are no longer the Church of Christ. They're the Church of the Latter-day Saints. <laughs> They're building a Latter-day Zion. They're going to move to Zion. So now the story unfolds. It's cool. Mm -hmm. So then you get 1838. Thus shall my church be called in these last days the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Now you're getting line upon line, more and more doctrines, more and more stuff that's completing, finishing up the great dispensation that is being given by Joseph Smith. Now we're going to get temple, we're going to get orange. So you're seeing the story develop. It's fantastic how I'm laying it out. But I'm including other things that are, have not been canonized. Oh, really? Yeah, so the idea is that these are the... the 1886 Polygamy of Revelation with John Taylor? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's going to be on Joseph Smith up to his point. Okay. But there are, for example, you know, when he was on the science camp, he had a revelatory experience. Mm -hmm. The heavens were open to me, and I know this man was named. That is a revelation he received. Now, it's not canonized. It's not like verses and so forth. But that is a revelation that is in line with the history of who he was. How are you going to decide which revelations to include? In That's going to be the trick. Yeah. That's going to be the trick. Because, because a lot of it is esoteric things. But the idea is I'm going to include more than what we have. And it's not going to be another Doctrine and Covenants and that. And what's making this more difficult for me is that I need a lot more time to do church history without plagiarizing. Because there's so much out there uh, that could be um, taken from source material. But a lot of it has to do with the Joseph Smith papers and you've got the new church stuff that's coming out that's, that does a lot more background on what's the historical setting that created this and who the people were and all it, it can get out of hand mm -hmm. but if I if I if I focus in on the chronology and I focus in on a, a, on a, the synopsis of the history and the people with the way I do my insights and the way I do what I do I think it has some merit because that way and then I'll have to do a cross-referencing that if somebody wants to have a you go to a section so and so, uh, they'll be able to easily go to that because it may be out of sequence. It could be, for example, section one uh, in the Doctrine and Covenants does not come but later. Right. You know, so therefore, if you want to go to DNC one, you're going to have to go to page 56 or something instead right. of page three, you know. Right. You know, <laughs> so, but, but I've already got a lot of it done. That's cool because I've always wanted to read the Doctrine and Covenants in chronological order, but it's. It's but hard to go to the back and then forward. <laughs> the other one I'm working on that's going to be the, I think will be the one that might uh, cause me to have some dialogue with the intellect, intellectuals, if you want to use that term, or the brethren, if you want to use that term, is that I am already halfway through the five books of Moses by integrating into one whole your Genesis chapter 1, which is a prologue to Genesis. That's book, that's, uh, Moses chapter 1 is a prologue to Genesis chapter 1. And it's comparable to the Book of Jubilees chapter 1. Book of Jubilees was written in Gia's, Gia's language like Ethiopia text of, the, uh, of Enoch. And it's translated in 1902 by R.H. Charles that also translated the Book of Enoch in 1912. So I've taken that first chapter, and Ethiopic uh, uh, Book of Jubilees is also known as the Apocalypse of Moses, is 
vision. And so therefore, I start out with Moses chapter 1, highlight a few cool things about him going to the mountain, conversing with the Lord, and then being told, you write this in a book. Jubilees has the same scenario. He goes to the mountain, has a conversation, and is told, now you go write this in a book. So I put those together. Then Now you're going to get to Genesis chapter 1 compared to Moses chapter 2. So I put in bracket. Oh. And so now you're going to read like I do in the Joseph translation. Everything that flows naturally, including Enoch text, because we get the book of Enoch, don't we? Hmm. We get the book of Jasher in there, don't we? Because they're part of it. See how cool. I'm working this through? Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you get the story, you get Joseph of Egypt, you get Jasher in there because it's so rich. And then all of a sudden you get Abraham, oh, you get Abraham first, you get the book of Abraham in sequence within the five books of Moses. Oh, wow. And then I have Enoch uh, going to validate the Abraham text. See, so I bring all this stuff as one whole. So the guy I talked to on the phone, Dr. Rust, Professor Rust, when he was on the phone, he says, this is earth shaking what you're doing. <laughs> this is monumental what you're doing. Because instead of flipping and doing this and changing and adding these other books that Nephi saw that would testify the prophets, I'm integrating. Yeah, that's awesome. That was really cool. So, not bad for a microbiologist. So, your, <laughs> your next project is Doctrine and Covenants. Well, and I, would say, I would say right now, I should be completing the five books of Moses. Oh, so that's However, next. I cannot guarantee you that it will be next year. Uh, I just don't know because, again, it goes back to funding. And I've spent so much of my money, and I need a return of what I've already done. So you guys got to go buy his books. Yes. Yeah, it's not that I'm trying to uh, say, help me, help me, help me, but I'm trying to help you. <laughs> and the purpose is not for me to get the, the, you know, the monetary part. I really want to be spiritually fed, and I have been spiritually fed especially at these conferences because I'm from the East Coast I get to get out and people get to come up to me and tell me how much I've helped them so that's really the goal of what it why I did this is because I wanted to help me I struggled reading the scriptures I needed a way for me to not be bored with the scriptures so when I started this project it was for me right and others saw what I did and they go that would help me as well right and so I'm doing this for us. And you can learn from it if you are in that place too where you want some extra help. This is one of many helps you can go to. I, I said that when I, I, I teach the um, Come Follow Me classes, the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And when I brought in my version of what I did with the book of Isaiah, because we had that this year, and I go, I'm only one book that you can go to the Desert Bookstore, and I think they have 20 plus books on the book of Isaiah. And mine's the most expensive. Yeah. And I'm the least credentialed of them all. <laughs> However, I have something that no one's done before. So these are for sale at Desert Book? All of them. Oh, nice. And Costco. Wow. And Amazon. But, and you can get them through the Firm Foundation. You can get them through Digital Legends Press. Right. These are the, so, Boy Tuttle is my publisher, and so he has them on his website. Rod Meldrum has his website. Uh, you can get them th here out in the West. You can get them through these bookstores and the Costco stores. Out in the East, we don't have them. They don't sell them in the Costco's. That's not where the LDS community is. Right. However, I do have a website, and it's Beacon Light Books. Mm -hmm. Just go to beaconlightbooks.com, or you can email me at Dr. Hawking. That's like Doctor Hawking at Gmail. <laughs> it's David Robert shortened to Doctor, <laughs> and uh, at Gmail, and just call me or you know um, email me, and just I'll work with you. You know, it's not. It, there's no standard price. I have it on my website. I pay for the shipping. I can sign books. You know, they are my property. I bought them. It's my labor. It's my effort. Uh, how I distribute it is through Boyd Tuttle. He is the publisher. He has the right 
to set pricing and so forth and so on so that we don't uh, dilute you know the market and get competition so we have to maintain what you call marketing con integrity however having said that since I'm the owner and publish I'm, I'm not the publisher but I'm the owner and have the paid for them and the, I inventory them and I can sign them I'm free to do what I want with my own property mm -hmm. and I'm not here to absurd any other mechanism for you to get the book however if you want to talk to me I, I love it when people call me I love it when people want to have interaction with me because it's it's human to human it's brother to sister it's brother to brother and uh, it means a lot to me when I have conversations with people mm -hmm. because that's my goal is to talk to people and to get people to help and it's so rewarding. I mean, it's emotionally rewarding to me. It's a spiritual experience for me when people, you know, I get emotional here, but when people tell me how much I've helped them, and uh, gosh, that is a good feeling. And uh, boy, is it worth it. I mean, I, I could lose all that I have, and if I have one person, and I have now hundreds of people tell me, Brother Hawking, God bless you for what you're doing. You have made a difference. Wow, that makes me feel great. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, yeah, so Five Books of Moses is next, and then you're working on the DNC as well? Yeah, it's a project I have ongoing. Those are your next two. Okay. And then you'll have to figure out something else to do, I guess. Yeah, who knows? By then I'll be, what, 75 or 74, and if I keep on going... Uh, hopefully the software can last through these different, you know, upgrades that they do with Word and all that, with not Word, but with the uh, Windows. I guess, I guess we're into lib, uh, Windows 11. Yeah. I'm hoping it's compatible. I haven't got, I have to get a new computer now uh, <laughs> because I've got one that when I came to the conference, you know, my, I have a VGA that I have a converter that goes to HDMI, but somehow the converter is messing up their system. Oh. And so I have to put everything on a, a flash drive and then get one of somebody to, can I borrow one of your computers? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so here I am trying to make money and you can tell you don't have much because I can't even get an extra computer. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the, the books are really pricey. I understand that. Uh, but there's but a they're full color and they've got but the, the reason yeah. why we did it is because we wanted to make them really special we wanted to make them heirloom quality when I say we that's Rod and I and Boyd Tuttle uh, and Boyd helped me with the uh, what I call the the look and feel I had it in a different color format and I had a different kind of a feel to it and it was good and people loved it uh, and that's what we took to the scripture committee and they loved it but his, his market survey was, you know, this is kind of old look. Let's freshen it up uh, with the blue and the gold. I, I chose all those. In the software, you have what you call the color combinations. Mm -hmm. you, you normally, on a, on a video, you have RGB, as you know, yeah. red, green, and blue. Whereas in printing, you have CYMK, that's cyan, yellow, magenta, and black. <laughs> K is black. And so you blend the different, you know, blendings of the numbers, if you want to call it, to come up with the color. Right. So I blended whatever, whatever you see color in my book. It's the blend that I chose. Right. But the blend I chose on CMYK was being visualized by a RGB monitor. So there is a conflict. So a lot of the things that's behind the scenes is that I was unfamiliar of how a CMYK would look like in print, knowing that. I have an RGB monitor. <laughs> so I had to do is... We're really I, getting techy now. I, exactly. So what I had to do is send portions of my text to the printer in, in uh, Hong Kong and say, how is this transposing? So when I did red lettering and the blue lettering, when I first did it, it, it didn't look good yeah. because of the RGB monitor. So then I went with a whole series of blending. And I sent them all of the file with the, and they sent me back all of the prints that would look like with these different combinations. Right. And then I said to my wife, okay, what do you think? Which is the best looking red? What's the best looking blue? Right. And that's why I made the choice. And I did that for the cover. It's the same thing, the blue cover. Mm -hmm. So now the church had an issue with that because their Book of Mormon is blue. And they said, you can't do blue. And I go, 
but I don't know your code. They don't have a color copyright on color. Yeah, exactly. I said, I don't know what your code is. I, you know, give me your code so I can see if I've mimicked it. And then silence and never yeah, heard anything from yeah. it. But what I'm getting at is that every code color I have, the gold color, you know, those other things I have, I blended it. So, you know, th that's the technical side that I go to. That's my technical nature, you know. Yeah. But, uh, but I chose all those colors. And I did it because the book of Mormon started, it was gold plates. So I wanted the gold oh, to come okay. up. So that was my gold theme. Well, I like the, what do they call that on the side, the leaf, the, it's kind of gold leaf. It's yeah. a gold leaf, yeah. yep. And uh, I have, you know, it's what they call Smythe binding. So what's nice about this is you have a big book like this. In typical books, when you open them up, they don't lie flat. You know, if you have a page like this, it would start to go back here. Right. Because they have the glue in the back. Mm -hmm. And they're hard. So if you do something like this, they lie flat. That's because there's this thing called a Smythe binding, which means that they're all laced in. They're all, it's a uh, way to uh, sew them in, the pages. Okay. So that when you open it up, they lie flat. Oh, nice. So that's why this lady who told me you ruined my life, she has a thing she can put it like this on her kitchen table, and, and it's not it's not going back and forth all the time with the pages, right, you know. Yeah. So that's why, and and also the quality of the paper is there is a shine to it, so a certain light can make it difficult to read. However, it enhances the color, and it uh, it makes it easier to uh, to store for long term. Uh -huh. They call it coated paper. And the beauty of it is that my software, no, not knowing anything about printing, it has these little buttons on it that says, what is the formula for your paper? I don't know what a formula is. So I call back to the printer and go, well, what kind of printing process formula or naming? And so, so they gave me these weird names and I go, lo and behold, they show up on my software. <laughs> I get to pick that little button and click on it and that's what they're going to use. Uh -huh. So that's why the quality of the, the printing looks so good, as well as the images. So the software I'm using has a built-in photo editor. So when I, if I down, uh, uh, you know, these are all um, what I call uh, public domain pictures. And I label every one. Here's where I got it from. Here's where I got right. it from. But they could be very low resolution. Yeah. And so I need to upscale them to make it look pretty. Well, the software is built in to do it. And it has color correction. I can go in and correct color. Wow. And so the printer was impressed. They go, what software are you using? Like, it doesn't exist anymore. I got it out of England. It's called Page Plus. And they go, wow, this is a good software package. That's yeah. why it looks so nice. All of my so books have a beautiful... You don't want to upgrade your computer. It'll break it. Yeah, exactly. But anyways, it's a little technical at the end here. But what I'm getting at is that these are high quality printings yeah. with a lot of thought behind it. And that's why the price is a little higher yeah. than a normal, just standard print. Yeah. And it's an heirloom quality, meaning that you should be proud to have it in your home and have something that says this is quality. Yeah. Well, that's exciting. Well... Any last thoughts before I let you go? I want to thank you, Eric, for uh, having that short little conversation at the conference because I've watched your uh, work that you've been doing and I admire you for why and why, uh, what you're doing and why you're doing it is to get this out there you know, so that people who are like-minded have an ability to see what others are doing, what's in their heart and their soul and uh, to experience band on it and enlighten people and give them an opportunity to see who these people are and how they think and feel and I thank you for that because you've given me a wonderful opportunity to give those who don't know me to know a little bit more about me yeah. and why I'm doing what I'm doing yeah. and thank you for that well I appreciate that and so this is kind of a labor of love I just love doing this love talking to people like you and and so uh Thank you for all your hard work, and uh, go buy his books. They're awesome. <laughs> you can get them autographed. I like. I, I bought them this weekend because um, they're. I know on the price list, and I, I don't know if that was a special price. It was. They started at like seventy-five bucks, but if you get all five, I got them for like two hundred, which I thought was a pretty good deal. So. Yeah. So yeah. So that was only forty bucks a book. So. <laughs> so I don't know if Boyd Tuttle's still doing that, but. Uh, yeah. 
So check it out. But you go to Dave Hawking's little beacon like, or you contact me, and I'll help you uh, if you need some help. If you need some help, let me know. I'll help you the best I can. Uh, Amazon. uh, Check out his website. Give us one one more time. Beaconlightbooks.com. Beaconlightbooks.com. Digital Legends. Check that out. Yeah, or uh, Firm Foundation. Yep. Yep. They're all. You can get them all these places. So, all right. Well, David Hawking, I thank you so much for being here on Gospel Tangents. And thank you for allowing me to participate in this wonderful conversation. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with David Hawking. David, thank you so much for sitting down with me. I think you've put together some amazing resources, and I hope people get more acquainted with them. Uh, Once again, at Christmas, get a copy of the New Testament so that... uh, you can, you can study more and uh, learn a lot more about that. So he's put an amazing New Testament together. In our next conversation, we're going to stick with the New Testament. And this time we're going to talk to BYU professor uh, Dr. Trevin Hatch. And we're going to get more acquainted with his book, especially he's got an amazing book called A Stranger in Jerusalem, which talks about Jesus. I wrote it with undergraduates and beginning graduate students in mind, like my students at LSU when I taught at LSU. Okay. Christians, some non-Christians. <clears throat> so I pictured an eager group of upper-level undergrads or beginning grad students who, uh, who need more, you know, uh, about the culture and the Jewish culture in the background of the world of Jesus. If you like what we're doing here on Gospel Tangents, please become a paid subscriber at gospeltangents.com or patreon.com slash gospeltangents. We've got full transcripts on our website at gospeltangents.com. And if you'd like to check out some of our other conversations, click over here. Thanks.